This is the Neo Books call for Monday, April 1st, 2024. That is April Fool's Day, just in case anybody tries to slip a fast one on us today, uh, or in case we want to do something subversive ourselves. Who knows? Uh, it is nice to see you all. Hi, Jose. Hey, guys. Just, I just turned on the recorder and everybody's just showed up. So we are right at the top of the top of the call. Um, good to see everybody. Uh, any news from anybody? Any thoughts from where we've been? Um, I have, uh, I, I'm not, I think it was David that, that shared that uh, scientific uh, nano data thing. I can't even remember what it was called. Yeah, I did actually. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you for that, Rick, because it sent me down a nice rabbit hole. I appreciate <laughs> that. Nice. Um, I think I think there's something there that sort is consistent to what we're talking about. Yeah, I think it's more on the scientific end. Mm -hmm. But uh, having said that, that doesn't mean to say it's not generalizable. The idea, uh, you know, there's nano ideas are similar to a nugget. So I can't say what the differences are, but or the similarities, mm -hmm. but conceptually there's overlap i think there's a huge overlap there yeah and and i i think it's very consistent with what's happening which is sort of the fragmentation of of these things that would traditionally have been you know a book or a paper or a, you know and and uh and you know it gets lost in there right the the yeah. the, the nugget gets lost in there which is the um, which is the, the link that you're talking about can you reshare it back into the chat because i think i i think i know but i'm not finding it um, well, while you're doing that, I, I, I'll just, I was in an AO call where there was a very interesting conversation about the whole notion of copyright and the whole notion, uh, you know, the whole notion of copyright, I think is almost antithetical to what this is emerging into. And it's really about attribution rather than copy. It's not proprietary. It's open knowledge give attributions where it, it belongs exactly and what's interesting what's interesting i got pulled over over the coals over this by by a physician saying i was right i was just using chapter g4 for and the guy went off the deep end he was an anti-ai vigilante and sort of originality yada yada and and so i challenged him i said you know use ai any ai tool you like cut and paste anything put it in there Sh show me where i did any plagiarism <laughs> But having said that, those accusations are going out. And it's interesting how people frame it as plagiarism, which I think you should just say, it's not plagiarism, just make attribution clear. Exactly. And sometimes your attribution may not be right because you didn't do a deep dive into find out who the hell came up with the idea in the first place. Well, and that's the thing. Most ideas don't exist in our heads, right? They're amalgamations of everything that we've learned. And exactly. And then in that moment of context, something kind of, Clicked. you know, an aha. And did I come up with it? No, I just put two pieces that everybody else has come up with, right? And, well, and I, I think when we think, I'm sorry, I was just going to say, I think when we think I created that, <laughs> that's where the problem starts, right? Well, it's funny you should say that because I, 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 I don't know who coined the phrase. It's been, but the definition is the issue, not the, the coining of the phrase. But I coined the phrase neo-terrorism. And um, I looked at, you know, I went into perplexity AI, which I find as a slightly better search than chat GPT-4. And it gave a citation. And I thought, hey, that's not right. So I then put it in and said, when did Rick Patello first use neo-terrorism in a LinkedIn article? And it was several years before that. Now, I'm sure somebody else has used the word before. Well, it's difficult to, well, I, I don't think this anyone's got a definition as I provide it. But to me, this comes into the whole issue. I mean, the, the meta aspect is, you know, how do nuggets morph over time? And how does the meaning shift and, and whatever? So we're, we're in a much more nebulous realm of knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I think it's closer to reality. Oh, absolutely. Exactly. The other one's artifactal, and it's very egocentric. Yes. And um, narcissistic, particularly in academia, because everyone loves their own books. You know? Anyway. And I, th and I think that separating us from the idea that it is our idea. 
Exactly. And that we own it and that we have, you know, that it's the commons. Yeah. It's a that's, that's I think shift. what we're talking about. Yeah, it's a huge mind shift. Um, so I have uh, Rick, I have an old idea I called an attribution server, mm -hmm. uh, which I never proposed to Google, but the idea was that um, copyright conflates ownership, control, attribution, and a bunch of other things that don't need to be conflated. It's a stupid idea to tangle them all together like that. Mm -hmm. And what if we separated them out? And if you had an attribution server, I could send a snippet of something into the attribution server. And it, this could just be a feature of regular search. And it would cough back up. Oh, this is the first instance I find of this. And here's the tree of the der der derivatives. And you know you you could and and you could even use that tree to reward the originator or a derivative you love <clears throat> by sending them a, a tip or you know direct patronage, but but instead we've conflated all these other sorts of things that that are not helping anybody I don't think well they're helping a few big companies that are making some money from owning the copyrights, um, making a lot of money, <laughs> making making considerable buck yeah and and it's funny do you guys know the book. Uh, what color is your parachute? Mm -hmm. So Richard Nelson Bowles uh, is the author of What Color Is Your Parachute. He was a he was a, a minister before, and then uh, as people were starting to leave the church, he wrote a little job hunting guide that he would mimeograph back in the day for other uh, ministers leaving. And then he was like, "This could be a book." So he signed a publishing deal with Ten Speed Press, which was terrible. It basically gave them full rights forever. And he never could get out of the deal, but he would rewrite the book, actually rewrite the book pretty much annually. <clears throat> and it was such a good bestseller that they had to remove it from the bestseller lists because otherwise there would only be like nine bestsellers forever. Um, it, it sold so, so regularly. Um, but anyway, he had a horrifying deal because intellectual property and cop, you know, who owns the copyright and all that stuff, but he still, he still did okay through the whole thing because, because the volume was just so good, but he could never, he never got out of that deal with 10 speed press. So I try not to buy anything by 10 speed press. <laughs> um, so yeah. And the nanopubs thing is interesting, but it seems to be mostly about metadata. Cause I think I investigated it. And it seemed to be a kind of couples around metadata or something like that. I'm trying to revive the thought in my head, in my wet brain, but I'm not uh, quite getting there. It, it is structurally metadata, metadata, but it's the idea that you're breaking it up into pieces, right? Yes. But it, it is the metadata, which is, I believe, what really, I think the value of a nugget isn't just the nugget itself for sure right that that's i take a sentence i put the sentence out there so what uh but i take that sentence and i say here's how it relates to da, 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 and where it comes from and who it did da, 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 da. and then all of a sudden it, it has life in it um and so to me the the relationship between those two things is exactly that it's the fact that it exists by itself, but it describes how it comes about and where it goes and, and all of those beautiful links. I have a question though, in terms of tracking nuggets. So if somebody else decides they're gonna use this nugget, they can change the meaning, the context that would shift a little bit um, what it means or how it can be used. And so I don't know, um, this is for the techies here, uh, how well you can actually track, you know, if you want to say how many people have used this nugget, what is this connected to other, what are the context of how it's used, um, whether there's a capacity to do that. So part of the reason for neobooks and for deconstructing them into nuggets is to create opportunities to compare different opinions about what a nugget means and what its context right. is. So that that is like not a problem, that is actually a virtue that yeah. we're looking for. Yeah. Um, because I want to know that you think I'm having a I'm having a disagreement with a friend about what black swans means. He thinks black swans are just randomness of almost any kind. He really has a, an extremely broad definition of black swans. And to me, black swans are 
things that are incredibly difficult to conceive of even happening, but then happen. And all of a sudden we make an explanation afterward, but it was a black swan because we couldn't picture it happening. So for him, somebody's getting on the freeway next to you, it's conceivable that they could cut across your path by accident and um, that that's a black swan event. And I don't think so. And um, Stacy's pointing out with a DM that I'm ignoring Dave's hand up, which I totally missed. So I, yeah. I will go to Dave in just a second when I'm, I'm done getting like my myself snagged in by this this whole conversation. Thanks, Stacey. Um, and and so we have a divergence about what black swan means. So the black swan could be the nugget. And then then you get into a bunch of interesting technical questions that are beyond my pay grade that you just raised, Rick, which is how do I know which is the right nugget, the original nugget? How do I know this nugget wasn't changed or forged? Um, how do I know we're not doing combat on a nugget that we've like? Can people agree, who agree on a definition of a nugget preserve that nugget and keep it kind of whole as it is? And then so it can be compared to a nugget that may have the same name, black swan, but a very different definition. And how do those things show up over time so that they form the foundations of really interesting and useful productive arguments, as opposed to combat on just, you know, the problem with Wikipedia, for example, is that there's one page for black swans. And they're allowed to say, here's the controversy or something uh, within the page and certainly the history of it, but you can't really have two different pages for black swans in Wikipedia. And I think inevitably in a neo-bookish environment, we're going to have uh, multiple kinds of nuggets representing things. There's not gonna be a canonical one. My hope is that we crystallize as communities of belief around different nuggets and nugget webs, for example, uh, nugget, you know, narrative webs uh, over time. Sorry, Dave. Go for it. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, I'm late. Can can you give, guys give me the one sentence overview of, of what you're talking about? Anybody? <laughs> yeah, I was wondering too. You're talking about nugget environment. We don't have a nugget environment. We have been oh. talking about a nugget environment, but we don't have one. So, so it, it's a lot of <clears throat> very detailed abstract conversations I don't follow either yeah I'm hearing copyright stuff and commons and I mean that's what that's that's the that's what I kind of pinned myself on to but I don't know maybe it's about something else is it about ownership and you know um, royalties and you know well it started out about a couple different things and then we then we brought up copyright not being helpful here Okay. And then, then we went into, then Rick raised the issue, hey, what if there's conflicting ideas of what a nugget even is? Um, so we've spun off already in a couple of different directions and we're 15 minutes into the call, <laughs> um, which is faster than usual for what we're up to. Okay. Uh, so, so we're kind of mixing up a couple of different things, which I think are not that far off at hand, Klaus. I, I, you know, we've got nuggets, it's just that nobody knows about them and we're not using them as nuggets quite yet, but we're, I think we're like, like pretty close on to it uh, in different ways. And, and so Dave, I apologize. Uh, over to you with your stand up. <laughs> yes, like it further confuses us. Um, and thanks Stacy for, you know, scanning up for me. Uh, <laughs> the, well, I mean, I guess like, so I've been kind of thinking that we have, we're, we have two conversations that are also, that are both important and you maybe have to choose one, I don't know. But one is kind of what is the architecture of ideas in some sense? Do you, do you start with nuggets and what do you build them up into? There's like a construction metaphor here, here I think. And I was, I, I was thinking back on, like I got Scott McNeely to talk uh, one time at an international development group around uh, the around open source. And he talked about like, you know, what if we were, what if we sold people the letter E? You know, and you know, it's like nuggets are made up of letters, I guess, right? I mean, you know, we have we have a hierarchy of kinds of notion of things that we use to build stuff. Some of them are open and reusable, and some of them aren't. Um, and but they're kind of all nouns, right? And we're building ideas out of them. Um, and I and I think we're fl we're flopping over into the motivation section, right? What why do people like write books? Well, do they write books to have to 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 make a living? If they're writing books to make a living, how do we protect their living using copyright? Right. So there's a there's a whole set of motivations around create the idea of creation stuff, which I think are verbs. So we got the nouns, we got the verbs. And it's and I actually think that the really interesting question 
there is a really interesting question in like what's a nugget and how does it be useful i think so that's an interesting question the harder question may be what's the what makes that nugget dynamic right how is it you create a system wherein people are willing to contribute whatever it is and build upon it right so that they become more valuable and to me it's that that dynamic process that we really really haven't figured out and you know i think we probably have some models though um, you know, if you look at GitHub, you have a whole bunch of code nuggets that are being reused, right? And you can track the reuse, right? There's a citation process. You can give credit to the original, you know, filer of those things. I mean, there's a whole bunch of kind of interesting infrastructure goes with that. I don't really know how the ASCAP stuff works with songwriting, but songs can kind of be reused. And there's an institution that pays people for who've written songs for their reuse, and I don't really know what kind of control they have over, like, you you can't, you know, like, all this stuff about Tracy um, Chapman's song being redone on country radio. As far as I know, she didn't know the country music artist was going to do that song until she started getting checks for it, basically. Um, so, you know, and we have some mechanisms for this kind of thing in different media, and they may be different in different media. Um, and then, so, the, then the, th the third thing I would offer is I have kind of decided from my perspective, like looking at the regenerative future, that you want dynamic, you want a dyna dynamic commons, intellectual commons, and you want that commons to be getting better as fast as you can. And kind of there's a default, which is if the marginal cost of distribution is close to zero, it ought to be in the commons. Like there ought to be a strong bias for society to put things into the comments. We, you know, that should be kind of the rule unless there's a really good reason not to. And so all of these discussions about that's, you know, indigenous people own this language or, you know, that's my soil data or, you know, kinds of things, I think are threatening the notion of building up this intellectual architecture that, that feeds the comments. So, you know, maybe we have to say the soil isn't the farmers, it's the lands or something like that, but does the land get to decide who, who owns their data? Um, so anyway, I, I feel like the, the economic notion of zero marginal cost is kind of kind of a useful one. And it's like, if it, if it can be shared, it should be shared is the, is the default. I love that, Dave, thank you. And, and you're right on, right on the right track uh, about sort of how and why about all this stuff. And also you raised an interesting point about attribution versus appropriation in some sense, um, where earlier uh, we were just talking about how attribution is important, but we've conflated it with other stuff. But appropriation is kind of, hey, you can't use that concept, it's our concept. It's like, well, it needs to be, if you really were Maori or whatever, or Hopi, you would want this concept to infect everybody because you'd want this to be the way we all see about it. So how are we supposed to talk about it without mentioning it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Klaus, then Stuart, then Rick. So in the last meeting, um, we ended up uh, with me saying that I'll have a meeting with Pete scheduled. Yes that you wanted me to report back to how this meeting went. And, and that is, on, that is in, in my brain as the agenda for today's call. Yes, thank you. There is an agenda. <laughs> well, I, I put it in my brain, which we don't, none of none of us but me consult, but yes. Okay. Um, so, so <clears throat> where, where, how, do, how do I frame this? So, you know, I'm working with uh, uh, climate system solutions um, and my partner from from the biofuel sector there, and we're actually creating a network with uh, with uh, uh, the CEOs of medium sized companies, all focused in the uh, food and agriculture sector. Um, mm -hmm. And the idea here is that we are providing a networking structure um, uh, guided by uh, AI and uh, following up on, on stitching together relationships that are complementary, like between a CPG manufacturer and a farmer. So we have uh, you know, a, a couple of dozen people right now who are interested in this process. So when, when you think about AI, uh, Pete gave, gave me like a two hour uh, uh, deep dive into you know, how this thing really works and what it is. And the, 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 the bottom line is you can't transfer it. You know, the, the, the AI really in and by itself is 
is dumb. You know? So the, the it only really works because the way I interact with it and what Pete is saying, it's not that the AI get, is getting smarter, you are getting smarter uh, and, and smarter in using the AI. So the problem is I can't just give somebody uh, a link to my uh, my chat GPT uh, because they wouldn't really know what to do with it. It just wouldn't work. Um, so we have to create, uh, but overridingly, um, many of the, most every company out there right now is working on AI. Uh, and you have large companies that are putting entire teams you know, on developing an AI capacity. So when you look to small and medium-sized companies, they don't have access. No, they, they, they just don't have the, the resources to, to dedicate to uh, uh, training up a chatbot and to interact with them and to build up a library of, uh, of, of knowledge that they need for their particular company. So we thought, so then I also had a meeting with, uh, with Jordan. He actually visited me in Bend. He, he was on his way through. And there is the opportunity for Lionsburg to provide uh, a platform where we can anchor that AI capacity. And the, it would be centered around uh, this NeoBook, um, where the NeoBook has you know, its home. Um, and, uh, and when I say NeoBook, I mean, we talk a lot about nuggets, but it's really the NeoBook that has components that may be applicable you know, in certain ways. But it's really the knowledge base that comes uh, within this NeoBook and to make that also searchable, you know, not beyond nuggets, just make it searchable. But then in that context, provide an AI capacity from which we can develop GPTs specialized for certain companies. And again, you can't just hand over a GPT because they need to be constantly worked and need to be constantly updated and upgraded. Um, and and uh, and you have to maintain the integrity of these GPTs. So we can create a home you know, for uh, building up an AI capacity that is available on a lease basis, uh, uh, I mean, per use basis um, to, to uh, 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 companies that are working on highly specialized things. For example, I just, uh, I just test run it with the uh, Bionutrient Food Association. They're working on what they call a, uh, uh, a nutrient density meter. They want to measure the nutrient density of foods. Um, and I, developed, I I went through with uh, with my uh, chatbot uh, to explore possibilities of using carbon intensity scores to correlate here, and it works. And it blew them away because they have two years of development work in this same question, and I was able to to come to arrive at the same conclusion in half an hour working uh, with my with this AI. So there is there is a real need, right, to to take the knowledge that we are accumulating in our neo books, and not, no matter what field you're in, to anchor that and make that information accessible, but then add an AI capacity to it. Yeah, so that's where we're going. Um, so so Pete offered to support me uh, in with, with the IT. Part Jordan is uh, on board to uh, to do the Lionsburg uh, use the Lionsburg infrastructure to house uh, this NeoBook uh, slash uh, no AI capacity, um, and we are scheduling a networking meeting with the companies that we have uh, connected with in two weeks from now. So that's 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 where I'm at now. And the, the opportunity here is for subject matter experts in all different areas of the, of, of, uh, the economy to assist and support this. You don't have to be a farmer. You don't have to be a food expert, right? But we need an IT infrastructure that just works. Uh, we need to have an IT infrastructure where we can connect people who don't otherwise find themselves and, and and support them. Uh, for example, we can take 
Na, der CEO vom Snacktivist, äh, der CPG Manufacturer, bis der CEO of Shepherd's Grains, who's uh, representing farmers in the Palouse, and say, okay, why don't we see how we can merge what you are trying to sell in the consumer market with what the farmer wants to produce and see what we need to do to fill out the middle. You know? What do we need to move this product from the farm to the CPG manufacturer to the market? So that's sort of the the, the idea where we're going, the, the blueprint uh, we're laying out here. I forgot I was muted. Um, Klaus, just for explanation, um, can you describe what you mean when you say Lionsburg can provide the infrastructure? Do you mean the OFC platform itself, or do you mean other sorts of things? Do you, do you know specifically what that would be? Uh, I don't have enough information on, Lions, on the Lionsburg infrastructure to answer that. But uh, um, Jordan uh, seems to have no issue in, in um, setting that up. The way this would work is that at CSS, we are offering AI capacity, uh, but we would then uh, contract that AI capacity with Lionsburg. So the, the AI capacity is housed with Lionsburg. That means, because my, I mean, for example, I mean, my partner, they, they, these guys have no idea what I'm talking about, right? I mean, they're just, it's all abstract. And so, so these conversations are just way too painful. So, so I can I can bounce around with Jordan and Pete you know, to provide this AI capacity. But then, the next thing we need are, are people who know how to how to maneuver AI. Right? You need you need then people trained on, even if they're not subject matter experts on a specific topic. You know, they they know how to manage AI. So we can then create subcontractors under the Lionsburg uh, uh, brand, who are, who are then now specializing to advance the AI capacity for the food and agriculture sector and make that uh, available. Now, we would want to have that um, somewhat exclusionary for CSS because we are building this networking capacity, but this would be on a contracting basis. It would be on a pay-per-use basis. So, so we're creating revenue models that can fund uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, this, this, whole, this whole machine there. Well, thank you. Um, Stuart the Neck. You lowered your hand, but you didn't unmute yourself. Thank you. <laughs> now I have. Good. So, so um, I, I want to go down two veins here. One, um, what Klaus just said, so there's a way in which, because we are involved in discussion here, um, Klaus is, I'm going to, I'm going to surmise, Klaus is tired of the discussion and he's taken his Neo book elsewhere. That's what it sounds like to me, okay? Whether or not that is... Um, the Neo book is exclusively going to go with whatever Jordan's providing, or there, there's opportunity to, to do it here also. All right. Um, and, and there's a way in which, to me, that points to the, the notion that we should be design and building at, at a bit of the same time. Otherwise, we're going to lose some opportunity, I think. It's the way I, I, I think about that. It's the way. And not that Klaus is doing anything, you know, deceptive, but in my mind, um, months ago, he had a neo book, many months ago. And and you know, we're we're just exploring different things that you know might be better off in a designed and build context. I'm painting with a very broad brush here. I um two as to um the concept of, of ownership, copyright, what we have with Nuggets, my sense is that um, this is about getting ideas out into the world, not about um, making money. They're not mutually exclusive. Um, however, I would, would be an advocate for, if you want to do a Neo book, with the OGM platform, then um, all um, 
royalties of any kind um, get back into um, OGM to fund the, the, the initiative of getting ideas out into the world that are important. Um, I say that in the context that most authors um, don't make very much money uh, on books at all. It's the ancillary stuff where the book is a calling card and you make you make money on that. I, I can provide personal examples. Jerry immediately picked it up because, you know, he's uh, he's he's having some direct experience of it with with his wife, April, right now. Um, so anyway, that those are the two things that I wanted to I, 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 I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. uh, can I just jump in on the making money thing? Because um, I do think that that is it, the issue isn't exactly making money. The issue is if what we want is this stuff to get better, there has to be a motivation for people to make it better. And I would argue most of the open content that's created never gets better. And so part of the, the we need a dynamic system that will make things better. I think is the, that's the that's the real catch. So Klaus created a book, I would argue. Not really a neo book because the nuggets are hard to pull out of Klaus's book, right? And it's going to be hard to make Klaus's book better because of the structure of it, right? So there, there. If if what we want is a dynamic system where these ideas are improving, then there, I think a structural. There's structural questions about how they're, what you know, what the nuggets are, and then there's motivational questions around what generates what what you know. Why do people contribute? Um, basically, and they have to have some reason. It may be money. It may be pride. It may be they want to make a difference in the world. There's a whole, I think, a wide set of motivations. But the system needs to be, I think, architected in a way that the motivations work. Yeah. I, I, I will just, I will just... just note that we are now mixing together about five different layers of things, and they're getting a little tangled. Go ahead, yeah. sir. No, I was gonna, I was gonna, I was gonna say, um, uh, Dave, that. Um, to me, I think the, the initial motivation was all about um, how can we get ideas out there um, that are contributing to the world? And I think we ought to, we ought to stick to that as the, as the, as the motivation. Um, just my, my response. And, and Dave, to, to the idea of nuggets, I just posted uh, the link to my newsletter uh, on LinkedIn, which are pervading taken out of the book. These are nuggets that are taken out of the Neo books, version one and two, right? The whole book is structured around uh, topics that are can that can be freestanding, right? You can take theory U or spiral dynamics or microbial uh, uh, management as individual freestanding topics, but they're also connected into a storyline. If I can untangle just a couple of things before going to you, Rick. Um... Stuart, I, I was not under the impression that Klaus is impatient with neobooks and is taking his ball to a different ball field. Um, uh, we had uh, mentioned that Jordan had published a book directly into KDP and all that. And, he, you know, the, the connection to Jordan is a sort of alive. But also, um, I think a big piece of what's happening with Pete and Jordan is trying to make alive the chat GPT version of Klaus's body of work. And that's not something we're directly equipped to do right now. We've been trying to connect my brain to GPT separately over in Free Jerry's brain, uh, but that's not that's not this process. So I, I'm happy that they're making progress on that, and that's why I was asking about the infrastructure that Jordan might be providing, whether that's the uh, open community platform that he's been funding or something else, and how that might work. But but a piece of the concern there is how do we make and Klaus, correct me if I'm getting this wrong. How do we make a simple enough interface? that farmers who are not geeks, who don't wanna to go to yet another platform can actually use it and benefit from it. And how do we put a business model behind it so that we can pay for the resources and make it all work? And that, that all resonates great for me. I think that's that's fabulous. And I'm I'm happy you're doing that. But let me pause to see if I got that wrong. So, so I was just explaining that this was my original idea, right? Is to create a GPT, hand it over to the farmer. It doesn't work, right? The, 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 uh... AI is still too primitive um, uh, to to uh, to be able to to uh, uh, create a an, a an understanding or have an in an intuitive understanding. You need to and, and so Pete was saying basically in uh, intuitively I developed a work style with the AI that that many programmers don't achieve because they want to program right right. 
and 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 I have I just have a conversation with this thing and and off we go. And so so the the this this AI capacity that we're talking about creating um uh, it's like a freestanding AI capacity based on specific topics will be very hands-on. You mean you need basically you need a handler. It's like you have a race car there and you need a driver for it. Okay. And so we need a lot of drivers going forward, hopefully, right? Because as we make this available, um, there will be many projects coming out of this where someone uh, uh, will be asked, where there will be you know, a question arising to research this. And this is how GPT is being used in companies. Yeah. You know, it's like my son, you know, is working for her for Samsara. They have one GPT effort going where this thing is tracking uh, self-driving cars, I mean, in their case, trucks. And they're gathering data, you know, for 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 autonomous driving on 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 semis. And uh, so this GPT is is doing just that function, right? So so that's really how this AI is being is being developed. So is part of what so you're saying is part of what you're saying there, Klaus, that you also need a, a a community of curators or gardeners or shepherds as part of this, and that's why you want to be on a community platform. Is that you kind of want to train up people who can be like you with this corpus of work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need. That's why I'm separating it out of CSS, and I just explained mm -hmm. it this morning to my partners, saying, "Look, this doesn't fit in here. You know, this is a total distraction." Because we are subject matter experts, you know, we have practitioners, uh, and and so we are using this as a tool. But we don't have really the time and knowledge and capacity to develop this tool. But here is a group of people that can really do this. So Pete offering to step into this and 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 engage is just going to put us onto a different whole different platform. Yeah. So this is a great example of how each neo book. <laughs> gets implemented as a real world project in a in a different way um depending upon what the what the quote potential applications are not just the intellectual development of it but the the applications of it which is where the real bang for the bucks are i think in terms of um uh, impact in the world yes and a design principle of neobooks if there are such things is to make these things so recomposable that assembling different business models and different kinds of things is easy and, ha and a happy event is, is like is, is doable, yep. right? Uh, and somebody else might want to take a piece of Klaus's corpus and do something slightly different with it. Um, and as long as it's open source available and all that, they can go do that. Uh, Rick, you've been really patient. Go ahead and jump in. Well, I'll, I'll say something in response to what said before and perhaps moving on if people want to move in that direction. But uh, Stuart, in terms of what you were saying earlier, I, I just have a different perspective and I see it as an open system for, or, or an open book for neo books in the sense uh -huh. of where does, it, where does it land? You know, where does it fit in? Because I think it's so emergent, we just don't know. Um, so I think, you know, that's how I'd respond to it. Though I, I do have a question for you, Klaus, because you said something where I thought, hmm, I don't know if I understand you right. And you said something along the lines that farmers don't know how to use chat GP4 or won't use it. On the other hand, um, you know, if if you had a uh, a Klaus chatbot where they don't have to know how to use it, all they need to do is to be able to ask you questions and go into the collective wisdom and knowledge that you're able to, to go and ask questions. Now, the reason why I bring this up is that um, I, I, I've got f fairly well acquainted with... Uh, Kent Langley, who is uh, uh, actually is doing a project, he, and I think you need to touch up, connect with him on uh, developing business models for regenerative agriculture. And I can make I can introduce you through LinkedIn, just in case you don't know him. But he, um, he he's he's doing a lot of work in this space. And so, how do you make it easy for people who know diddly squat about AI? They just want to know how to drive the car. They don't need to know what's under the hood. And if you make it so accessible that people can, you know, access the best regenerative food policy resources and people, anybody can access. Now, I just wanted to say that, see how you respond to it. Then I wanted to bring up another point. Yeah, I think uh, um, this whole understanding how AI works and 
and what it takes to get an intelligent answer out of it is an emerging skill set. Yeah. And uh, and even for me, having worked on this thing intensely now for quite a while, I'm just now really understanding why uh, what I do works. Let me give you an example here. Um, so, so here is uh, a conversation that I had about biofuels, biofuel feedstocks. So it says biofuels are a major part of agriculture, often competing with the food supply, but also adding to the pollution of soils and watersheds. Here's an article. So I'm giving it, so this is my conversation, right, with the AI. So I'm giving it an abstract uh, that I that I uh, uh, unloaded here. Um, and this is just all feed information. And then, then here's chat GPT and uh, our supply side, create an abstract that summarizes these articles. So what I'm doing is I'm prepping the AI you know, to, to, uh, mm -hmm. to absorb the information that I wanted to work with. This is not my real question. This is just setting the AI up so that it uh, develops then you know, this abstract here. Then I'm asking, create a list of feedstock stocks that are most practical for the U.S., not compete with the food supply, can be raised on non-farm acreage. And then it gives me this list here, which is... Yeah, I mean, amazing, right? And these feedstock represent a range of options and so on. So that's how that's how you really interact with this thing. Here's another one, nutrient density uh, versus uh, carbon intensity score. So I explained to the AI, the federal government has created incentives for farmers to adapt regenerative practices, blah, 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 right? And then so then it gives me an opinion. Is it possible to use the same or similar criteria to measure nutrient density as it is used for CIS. Now it gives me an opinion on this, right? Potential pathways, conclusion. Then I'm saying, can you make the assumption that a crop with a low CIS score will have soils that have been farmed with regenerative practices? And then it gives you, you know, taps into a significant debate with blah, blah, blah. So then it gives me this information here, which I then forwarded to the Bionutrient Food Association, and they, they were saying, wow, this is crazy. You know, this, we worked on this for two years to come to that conclusion, and it took me half mm -hmm. an hour to get there. And I but think that's how AI works, right? I mean, you have to, you have to stimulate the conversation. You have to prompt right. to create a, a, a summary on this topic then you can ask it the question, right, to get something out of it. And I think, I think Rick, what Klaus was reporting in from his talk with Pete was that a Klaus bot, a freestanding Klaus bot wouldn't be able to manage everything that Klaus just talked through. So it's not, it's not currently conceivable to just let a freestanding Klaus bot loose into the regenerative ag world. No, no. Yeah, I, I wasn't, I wasn't, I was thinking that uh, this is where, you know, it's not my area of expertise. So I'm deferring to somebody else who, is working in the space and i don't know who's further ahead in yeah. how to make these sort of you know call them uh the virtual klaus curator i mean even what you just described there you still need a subject expert to go over and discern it the other question i have for you whether you're using other um ai tools to compare because I, I i'm interested in cross-validating things and i, I actually enjoy working with perplexity ai I don't know whether whether you've compared the different AI platforms as to um, you know how you can cross validate things. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, I'm only using ChatGPT, and um, it's for this it, it, for for a number of reasons that that are. Uh, I mean, you can have ChatGPT Enterprise, ChatGPT Team. You know, you can use you can create yeah. GPTs. It's the most versatile uh, 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 functionality there. But I just wanted to demonstrate that yeah, uh, I, understand. Yeah. I get these results is because of my unique professional background, you know, yeah. the unique educational track that I took. Mm -hmm. And so that's what it what it responds to. But I can train somebody, you know, to to use the same base in in uh, uh, uh but under these under these preconcepts. You know? Um by no, the I think way, it's fantastic. Uh, just as a by the way, um Rick. Um, chat uh, perplexity, basically the unpaid model is on chat GP, on GPT 3.5. If you're using perplexity pro, 
it, I'm just reading the Wikipedia page for it. It has access to GPT-4, Claude 3, Mistral Large, and an experimental perplexity model. Now, GPT-4 and Claude 3 are two of the three top la large language models right now. The third one being Gemini Ultra, um, which is doing really well. So, so you're kind of using the same engine in some sense when you're, the, it's just the perplexity is laying on a few other features of its own. Yeah, exactly. I, I just I've just been using it clinically in medicine, and I found it more useful than using be, because it, it it hones in more effectively for my purposes anyway. Yep. Um, but anyway, no, I, I just think you know that I, what I heard from your class was two things. One, how can you train other people to do exactly what you're doing, which is like having the sort of um, the expert tier level. Um, but below that is the curated level where it's just the end user who wants to come in and act stuff, be able to understand it and apply it. Um, so that's what I do. I want to come back to something about nuggets because I put a, a comment in there about nuggets um, that should they be static or dynamic? Uh, and I think there are pros and cons to that. And there's the good, the bad and the ugly. And you just have to take any any word that has flipped its meaning through propaganda. Take woke as an example, equity is another. And that's where uh, we get into these um, political wars and we're operating from different definitions. And so there is a merit to having a static definition that you have to argue for and against that definition rather than imposing a definition that favors your biases. So I think this, uh, there's a little bit more nuance in the issue of that in terms of are we talking about nuggets that, you know, in dealing with, say, wicked problems where things are going to evolve and change over time. And so you have to your, your nuggets have to adapt and be agile for the future versus something that you say, this is the definition of equity and agree or disagree with it. Say what you don't like or agree with. Um, and that's one of the things I've been trying to work on in, tr in developing a new learning process of developing collaborative learning communities. And uh, unfortunately, I think Dave left, but in the last week, he shared something um, and uh, he didn't realize he put a link to a video that was part of it. And I said, oh, that's interesting. I'm part of that group. And I went and listened to it. Um, and uh, what was fascinating for me, it was, I won't go into the details, but it was sense making. And I didn't, I, the sense making didn't make sense to me, which is fine. You know, that's okay. Everyone has to make sense in their own way. But I was more confused than enlightened. Mm -hmm. Now that could be my ignorance or whatever, or maybe it's the ignorance of the, of the sense maker. I don't know. Anyway, I, I, I took a look at this. Then I went back to another group where it was in. I just assumed this, is, this was open information. And unfortunately, Dave put a link in and he, really, he didn't have permission from the other people to share that link. So, so when I, oops, yes. So when in this other group, when I mentioned that, uh, you know, it was like, what, David, what did you do? You know, sort of thing. But interesting, if the person who actually summarized and made sense of that session uh, actually gave a good presentation, I said, that's, you know, it was much better than what I heard, although I didn't listen to it all because I, I just didn't engage me. But to me, this speaks to the the nature of how, you know, how are nuggets used, developed, and evolve. And to me, that's where the secret source has to come in, because having all these nuggets is one thing. It's a second thing to think, how are people going to get engaged and use them? And to me, that is actually more important than creating the nuggets, because if the nuggets don't bring attention, it's just another book on the bookshelf that doesn't get read very much. So how do we make nuggets attractive? Anyway, I'm going to put a, uh, I just updated this uh, blog post where I put in a definition of equity. And for those on the left, on the right, my challenge for them is to say, what do you disagree or agree with about this definition? And that's where I think you can get into some generative dialogue and be, perhaps build a little more middle ground so we don't let our dysfunctional polarizations and toxic divisiveness tear us apart. Anyway, I'll put it in. And this is my ongoing journey of trying to think, how do we create these learning communities, um, which I think is where we need to put even more attention to than the nuggets. Um, Rick, thank you. And I think the 
conversations and debates around what happened to the word woke over time, what happened to the word equity over time, are really interesting narratives that are connected to those nuggets and enlighten them. Uh, and so the exact relationship between those things, I'm not sure I'm not a linguist or a, or an ontologist or anything like that, but I think that that's where the vitality of this whole thing rests, is, is making sure that those things are available and, and that we can talk about them. Cool. That was a lot of stuff really fast uh, <laughs> that went in many different directions. We can take a breath for a second. Um, Speaking of which, actually, the article speaks about sacred silence and the importance of it. And there's a very nice, I have to go and validate this because I, I saw this. I have to go to the library and find the original, make sure I've got the original text about this uh, Lakota female scholar who gave a written passage about the differences between talking and speaking in indigenous cultures versus in Western cultures. It's a fascinating read. And um, having pauses to reflect and be quiet is good. Certainly is. Well, see, I'm just wondering where you are in the middle of this conversation. Where I, I am? Yeah. You've been listening with care, and every now and then you close your eyes and are, you're absorbing a lot. I'm just wondering how this is flowing through you, over you, or whatever. Um, chaotically. Um, cool. I think we're trying to hold so many things all at once. And um, I I have um, a brain that builds pictures mm -hmm. as soon as I hear something. So, and those pictures are usually structural in nature. So everything I hear, I kind of start creating a, an understanding of how that might work. And I'm struggling with how... I can see an old structure. I can't see a new structure. Uh, an old structure um, is closer to this little um, nano docks kind of thing, right? Um, very um, data science-y. And uh, then there's this new structure with AI, which my sense is that's where we're going. I mean. It, it's not going to be an old structure. It's going to be a new structure. But I don't know where that old structure hands off to the new structure. So if I think about a nugget in, in terms of data, right? Not, not what it represents and, you know, what, what it's going to, how people are going to interact with it and all that good stuff. I think all of that is, is all right. Everybody's, speaking to that very well i think but when i think of it from a data perspective it needs to be publicly available it needs to know what it is it needs to know what it's linked to it needs to know who spoke to it and so on all those other things right it needs to be essentially a, a very aware piece of data and uh that piece of data would in in historical terms <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure how warm it would be, but it would. Well, definitely... have you heard? Have you heard of uh, Nora Bateson's warm data idea? Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, I I think her. Yeah, I think warm data for her is a little different than what I'm saying, but okay. Um, I'm I it, for me, I've got noted contextual, relational, and interaction. So it feels like this, but mm, like what we're talking okay. about. Um, my sense is that there's a gap between the two things we're talking about that the, the the thing we know how to do is to build nuggets using data science uh, i i can i can build it in my own head to some degree 
am not a data, data scientist in any stretch of the imagination, but, but I can build it in my own head to some degree. What I think is missing is that to do that, we have to build data science like interfaces. Why are you saying data science here? Um, we're talking about a, in essence, we're talking about a relational database that is also a link database between the people and the things and what they relate to and what they're meaning and you know all of these other things and and so essentially from a data perspective we're not talking about a flat database we're talking about all of these relationships between everything right and that from that perspective requires a whole bunch of um, linking that isn't just let's write a document, right? And that that level of linking just oh let me just link sporadically here and there and everywhere without some kind of meta structure uh, becomes very impossible to to manage. So you you sort of need to have metadata that says this is linking to this in this way, and that's linking to that in that way, and this is a reference to it, and this is someone speaking to it, and this is something that supports it, and this is something that somebody's taking a different opinion on. Like, there needs to be an understanding of what's happening to the, to these nuggets. Um, and so, to me, all of that's in my head. Um, but then there's the, the question of AI, and how much could AI actually do that if AI actually got trained on those things, and on the metadata? In other words, how could we have that very complex data science side of things become very user-friendly because we've built an AI uh, or trained an AI to understand that when we reference things in a certain way, that it needs to treat them in a certain way. Um, and then we don't need to build the complex data structure, but we need to build that complex data structure to train the AI, but not necessarily for us to use the complex data structure. That's what I'm thinking about. Cool, thank you. And. I don't think any of us are data scientists in the room and <clears throat> nor are we lexicographers or, I mean, uh, Wendy uh, from Australia is actually some of these things, but um, <clears throat> Wendy Elford. Uh, and I think that some of the connections were, we've had several conversations here about metadata and about how to converse, how to create the sociality around nuggets and all that which we haven't made all that much progress on because we're not that technical in this group. Um, but I think if we leave things in a very accessible way and we begin to understand how to add metadata that we know we need in some way, and then we adopt other people's standards and protocols for doing so. So if we discover that the nano publications uh, project has a great way of uh, a great shorthand for creating metadata around X, then let's use their protocol and go to town. Uh, and then let's invite people who are doing these larger efforts to come in and say uh, either, hey, we've absorbed your, your, your corpus and here's what it looks like, you know, fully linked up into a more structured program. Or if only you had done this, we could do this with it. And then we adopt that and move toward that ourselves. I, I, think, I think we might absorb our way into having some of the things that you're looking for by doing the work that we're trying to do, which is maybe just simpler, in terms of nuggets that are linked together into narratives that are available for other people to comment on and do things with. So I, I like what you're seeing. I I have a feeling that we're not capable of meeting the full program you're talking about, but I have a feeling that if we work openly and are open and permeable to 
those who understand some of these things and don't get distracted with insights that may not be actually central to what we're trying to achieve, but maybe interesting, but maybe a tangent that takes us down some rabbit hole that we don't need to follow. If we sort of are aware of that, I think we can pick our way through this in a, in a nice way. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I appreciate, I, 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 I'm grateful for your now, just now painting the bigger image of what you're seeing is possible because I, it was lighting things up in my head as well. If I may, just before uh, Klaus jumps in, I, what we're talking about when we talk about all of this stuff with nuggets, it's a graph. It's a very complex, very large graph. Um, and and that those graphs get really messy really fast. And so how do we how do we um, use this new world in a different way? To, to simplify it for us mere mortals yep. is, I guess, what I'm trying to figure out. Agreed. Um, Klaus, please. Yeah, I'm not a data scientist, but I have worked with um, uh, massive data. So in my last job for, for this uh, German wholesaler, we had 24 million customers, and we had total sales data on every single one of them. It, it functioned similar to a Costco model. You know, where you have to buy with a card. So we were on SAP. SAP gathered, you know, every box of toothpaste you bought. Uh, so we had total data sets. And I worked with a data department. You now mm -hmm. we, had, we had some, and, and they downloaded all of this out of, out of SAP into Excel spreadsheets, which were massive. Wow. Actually, uh, they actually uh, uh, built Excel at capacity and then link them you know, into, into chains. But I was able, for example, to extrapolate um, the top three customers in one of our 700 stores. So before I visited a store, I would take a data dump and uh, found out the top three customers that produce like 8% of total sales for that store. They would go to the store manager and say, oh, by the way, tell me about this and this customer to understand if they even paid attention to their customers. Uh, developed a, a, an international key account organization using this data. Data is is what you I mean. It's it's a living entity, right? So so when you have, but you have to have you have to have a vision of where you want to go with this. You know? and and so and 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 it's quite creative you know, to 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 use it. Where, where I'm at right now, and I think this this is really what we may be struggling with. When when, when we when we meet with uh, uh, when I when I met with the farmers in the Palouse, right? My whole thought was, what is the value proposition that would get these guys interested in even listening to me, not to speak about what, working with me? What can I bring to them that is that is unique enough and valuable enough? To where they get interested and they want to pursue this relationship. So, so at this point in time, we, I'm 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 wanting to create value propositions that get people to say, yeah, this is something I would spend money on, right? Membership fees, you know, then uh, extra service fees, and so on and so on, because you need to get money in order to attract talent, so you can pay people who have to pay rent and have a family. They would love to do what you're doing, but they can't afford it, right? So you need to be able to, you, you need to have revenue in order to do that. And so what is the value proposition for someone else? So there is a lot of navel gazing about, you know, knuckles and this and that and the other. And it doesn't mean a thing unless you have identified someone to whom this may be meaningful, right? So who is that? And this, this is the idea of target market uh, 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 profiling, right? I mean, the the targeting your your customer base, targeting your you know, potential partners, and so on and so on. Target market uh, 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 management, and so that's uh, uh, that. That if we can switch our uh, our thoughts to who am I uh, adding value to? You know, for whom is this what I'm working on beneficial? Yeah. You know? Then you can you can start shaping this into a product 
that may actually live and, and breathe and, uh, and find uh, interested parties. So this is really, uh, uh, you know, at this point, um, uh, you know, hoping to develop this infrastructure. And if Jordan can pull it off, that would be amazing. But he, he probably has the tools to do it. You know, and then anchor your book or knuckles or whatever you want to call it. Knuckles to me is meaningless, right? You have to have a book where the story lives and comes together. And then out of that book, you take knuckles, but always connect it back to the book, back to the story, right? I mean, the, the knuckles are not some free-floating entities that have that have no connection. You now it needs to belong to a greater story. And then when you follow theory, your principles, right? You're bringing people down a curve into comprehension, into alignment, right? And so you need these nuggets because they stitch back together into a bigger story. So you have to start at the bigger story before you pull out any nuggets because those nuggets are supposed to get you back to the story. Now you may, you know, you may be able to use one or two nuggets to create a similar relatable related story, that's a different thing, right? But you have, I mean, I have this regenerative, regenerate America story, right? And in order to get there, there's a lot of things that uh, we have to talk about, you know, because it's a complex adaptive system, it's a wicked system. So we need to be able to understand relationships and connections. You know? So so that's that's where, now, if we can just get out of our own heads, you know, and spin, you know, with our nuggets here into who am I, who, who can I serve, right? Because right now it's all about who can I help, uh, who is helping others, you know? Let me help somebody who is helping somebody. So how can I be of service, right? And so that's that sort of uh, you know, where I would love to go and, and uh and, uh, and 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 just move forward, get 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 traction, and move forward. Yeah? Because we can't just twirl. Uh, 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 we need to we need to put an anchor into the ground and say, okay, you know, let's uh, let's take this and move it, move forward with it. Agreed. Um, which is why I'm rooting for you and your work with Jordan as well, and help, trying to help think about how this all fits as we go. Um, Rick, please. Yeah, maybe just to build a little bit on what you're just saying, Klaus, is how do you make it attractive where people are drawn to learn together and how to be able to do that effectively? So how do you contextualize the nuggets? But I think one of the big differences about neobooks is that one thing about a book, you have to read the damn thing well, from beginning to end. And sometimes you have a query and you just want to know something just in time. You know, I, I, want, I have this question. Let's see what this has to provide for me so that and so when when you flip from passive learning to inquiry based activated learning it's a different ball game altogether and um you know i i you know I, you mentioned the value proposition I, I i prefer to talk about the virtues proposition as an attractor uh they're both important but we get so locked into the business language of values that we sometimes undervalue virtues um so i i just wanted to put a slightly different but i, I want to share something and I haven't finished watching it yet. So I'd be interested to know what anybody has heard of this or not, but I'll just define it. It's a, it's a company and I'll just, it's very brief. And it says Versus is a cognitive computing company building next generation intelligent software systems model after wisdom and genius of nature. We represent a paradigm shift in the current approach to AGI. And I started listening to it and I thought, wow, this sounds really interesting. So I'll put the link in and that might be something to consider for a future chat. It's like, what comes after AGI? And what the point of what you were talking about is that it's actually trying to mimic human intelligence in such a way that it's different from the current AGI models. Now, how much is that hype marketing? Uh, I'll, let, I'll let people discern that for themselves. So I'll, I'll just put it in there so that um, so oh, we, you've got the Versus Foundation. Oh, good, good. I've got okay. a bunch. I've got a bunch of stuff on them: spatial intelligence management, spatial contracts. Gabriel René is one of the key people here. Mm -hmm. Introduction to the spatial web. Here's a, a, a web link. He wrote a book called The Spatial Web. Uh, Dan Mapes also wrote it. 
And there's this idea of using HSML and HSTP, hyperspace transaction protocols. And Pete and I squint at this and we're like, yeah, it doesn't smell right. Now, we don't know for sure that this is not the next best architecture, but this has never smelled right to me. And it feels like a distraction. I'm wondering about um, Carl Friston, uh, who is getting a tremendous amount of attention right now. Uh, here's Carl J. Friston. Uh, he is kind of the central uh, guy around the free energy principle and active inference, which is another big body of work. It's not nearly the same as the spatial web stuff I just pointed to, but it's another thing of equal mass and energy that's very attractive to a lot of people. And a lot of people are saying, oh, all this large language model stuff is, nope, nope, it's primitive. It doesn't actually help. It doesn't learn as you go. What you need is Bayesian math to do this. And, and I smell this and I'm like, well, if they show me systems that actually work in a couple, in a couple months, then I'll be like, oh, cool, it's working. Uh, and we have a really lovely, uh, at 1 p.m. today, Michael Lennon, who is an expert in these things, has been in our conversation for a while. So we we dig this up every now and then and sort of turn it over and he, he gets what we're asking. Uh, so that's another example of something that might be really great, uh, but might just be a distraction. So um, when I say let's be aware of distractions, that's kind of what I mean. Is this, we, we need to solve a bunch of problems that are above our pay grade as it is between how what sort of metadata do we want to look at warm data, like Nora says? Is that a good group? Is it nano publications? Is it someone else? We need to pick and choose from among exactly. nearby, nearby constellations of interesting work uh, in a way that serves some end user, as Klaus is urging us to do, um, with useful info. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out how do we do the simplest thing that could possibly work that gets us the compelling demo that you're asking us for, Rick, which I completely agree. How do we make on a nugget, tasty, juicy, and addictive. <laughs> well, how do we do the salt, fat, crunch uh, combo <laughs> of a nugget, of an idea that makes people want to interact on it, around exactly. it, and improve it, and reuse it themselves? And then I'll go back, Klaus, I agree with you about the dominance of books, but, but I, I think I'd rather refer to them as narratives. And I, I did a video long ago, um, 2010, I did a video called Nuggets, Narratives, and Points of View, which is where I first started being interested in the terminology of nuggets. And narratives are the stringing together of a variety of nuggets to tell a story. A book is a long narrative. A point of view is a stack of these narratives that makes up some set of ideas in some domain. And then you might have points of view about ecology, points of view about psychology, points of view about politics, who knows? Um, but, an, but sometimes I'll drop a nugget into a conversation that is completely out of place in that conversation. I'll say, thank you. And Stuart, I think you both, guys both have to boogie. Um, thank you for being here. Um, sometimes I'll drop a nugget that's out of context because I'm hoping somebody will say, oh, that's interesting. Tell me more. And then I can unfold the narrative around it and start to warm up other nuggets and start to bring other ideas into the room. So uh, Dave Witzel and I and, and Dave's wife, Claudia, visited uh, frog, singing frog, jumping frog farms a couple of years ago. That visit was really, really useful for me. And I'll tell a little piece of that story, which to me is a nugget, <clears throat> in a conversation about industrial ag, where I'll be like, one day the neighbor's ranch was flooding because there was a big rain and the jumping frogs wasn't, or singing frogs, whatever it is, wasn't flooding. And because they had regenerate, they had active, thirsty soil that was busy drinking up that water and feeding the aquifer, where the industrial farm had dead soil, blah blah blah. And I will let that sit. I won't tell the whole book. I won't, you know, the the nugget. I hope will do some work on its own. And if it doesn't, then maybe it'll stick in their head and they'll think about it later. Um, but for me, the nugget sometimes alone, uh, as short stories told, are very very useful to open up future deep conversations. Uh, Rick, you're muted. <clears throat> Sorry, no, I, I agree. It's a question of, uh, you know, to me, it comes to the receptivity of the learner and whether that nugget acts as a catalyst for further inquiry. So it's, it's you know, nuggets can be a source of musing that inspires people to, you know, become more proactive. Absolutely. You mentioned, uh, Michael, it, 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 it um, is giving a presentation this afternoon, you say? No, Michael he's, not, he's yeah. not presenting. He's a regular at the pre-jury's brain call that happened this afternoon at that same, oh, uh, I see. same Zoom as this at 1 p.m. Um, but we don't have a particular agenda on it. It's just that in that 
set of calls, we've occasionally dipped into the free energy principle and adaptive inquiry. Could you put those two links that you shared from your brain thing about, uh, because actually, yeah, you know, the, the at least the way it was, you know, one thing I'd say, yes, and I, yes, we have to have our feet on the ground. But on the other yeah. hand, you know, if 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 there is going to be a, a um, if you want to use the black swan analogy, analogy that somebody does come up with something that is more effective, then, you know, it's going to pull the needle in that direction. Who yeah. knows which way it's going to go? Yep. Yeah. So I'm giving you links to um, uh, the spatial the web, spatial and, web. And, the, and the Versus Foundation. Thank you so much. Yep. You got you got quite a brain there, man. Thanks. <laughs> well, I'm I'm curious about everything and I'm always feeding my brain. And I'm sad that the brain is such a quirky interface that everybody isn't like happily mingling in it because that would make me happy. Um, but well, there's you know, one thing, for, you know, that one thing is, is that um, Jose mentioned this. He's a sort of visual person, you know. Yeah, me too. And from and and interesting enough, I find I'm not that visual. I'm trying to become more visual because I find the the visual representation that you give it, it just doesn't, you know. And so, how can I become more um, uh, receptive to the visual representations of the brain thing? Because you you run you you do it, you know automatically and it's sort of like for me anyway just to let you know that for non-visual learners it does uh it's a challenge let's put it that way it can be overwhelming i know I, and i think i need to slow down the demo at the beginning for people who are not accustomed to it etc well interesting or verbally though have earlier you, on people were saying have you taken a look at uh, uh matching it with chat gpt yes so pete and i have worked a bunch Oh, you're reminding me. Uh, we have an open query with the brain support people because their API did not return a response when Pete was trying to connect it to ChatGPT. So we got pretty far. Pete, uh, Pete did, took a very nice swing at it, and uh, they the brain has not answered our question yet. So we're stuck there. Because we are also uh, offering a list of articles on, on the. CSS website, um, the problem, of course, is your list of articles is pretty useless unless it gets activated uh, and, and searchable, you know, it's an indexed. Exactly. Uh, there is an AI software that does that, apparently. So there are a couple of different offers now in the market that will let you submit a corpus of your own, which is what you really need. The problem with my corpus is I don't write a lot of essays into the brain you have to infer what I mean by it when I add things to the brain, because I will use thoughts as editorial content. So everything below a thought falls under whatever that thought says. I'm skeptical of these things here, but I don't write an essay that says, gosh, I'm skeptical about, you know, the spatial web or, or whatever else. But it would be interesting. So when we build this AI capacity, for example, um, it would be interesting to find a connection to the brain um, and uh, because the AI in and by itself, you know, is pretty stupid. But if yeah. there is, uh, if there is a connected search function to this wealth of articles uh, and information that you have in the brain, you could uh, you could make that uh, a resource base for the AI, right? Yes, that's our that's our goal. So we could incorporate that into the project that uh, Pete and Jordan and I are now working on. Yes. That would be terrific. Just as a very brief aside, I, I, I don't know the, I, I remember looking at it, but I haven't, but uh, are you familiar with uh, fatbrain.ai? Is that something you've heard of? Fatbrain AI? I, it's something I just heard of today. I thought, well, what's that about? It um, sounds familiar, but no, I have an old fat brain, not a new fat brain. Yeah, it's fatbrain.ai. Um, I do not have know, them just, in my brain. Okay, that's okay. fine. Well, there's at least I found one thing that can be added to your brain. This oh, is like I this feel... is like stump the brand. I mean, stump <laughs> stump the brain. I love it. Anyway, anyway, I, I I'm I'm going to look into it a little bit. That's all because I thought, well, this is an interesting uh, AI platform. Anyway, so I have just added it to my brain, so I can't say it's no longer in my brain, and I will go research it and hook it up properly when we're hanging up here. All righty. Okay, yeah. so. Anything else? Very. Oh, one other thing. I didn't finish my train of thought. Yes. I, actually, I enjoy the entanglements. You know, what was so, where people are losing track? 
I just love it. But, you know, I, you know, if, if people can't follow it or they get overwhelmed, um, you know, so I feel, you know, I can track that better than I can um, visual things. So we all have our, it's all part of our neurodiversity and how can we combine our neurodiversities in a way that we can um, create. Yeah, I'm not in favor of entanglements. I'm just thinking it would be helpful to make them directional. You know, yeah. where are you going with this thing? There has to be a direction yeah. somewhere. Yeah. And well, so I'm like, yeah. it's a focus. I'm a project manager, you know, I'm a project guy. Yeah, right. And they are focused on where I need to go. Right. And so I love entanglements if they are creating some serendipity or you know some uh, some sparking points. But uh, uh, it's it's all too easy to wander into the wilderness here, you know, and then uh, you lose you lose sight of where you actually would have uh, liked to go. Agreed. Yeah, you, you need to get out of the swampy lowlands, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you want okay. protection from tsunamis. Um, thanks, everybody. Thank it you. Fun. Right. It was right. fun, Bye. even if it was sort of fangly. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs>